Accounting for Variance in Machine Learning Benchmarks Benchmarks are one of the driving forces for the progress in machine learning research. We have here results on SSD2 binary sentiment analysis from papers with code. Throughout the years, new methods are published with their accuracies on a set of benchmarks. Some of them mark new state-of-the-arts and drive the progress further. Or do they? If we change the relevant parts of the experiments, such as the weights in civilization or the ordering of the data, will the rankings change? Will we witness different methods establishing the state of the arts? Measuring the performance of learning algorithms is a noisy process. In this work, we investigated three questions to help improve the methodology used to infer new state of the arts. Question 1. What are the different sources of variation and which are most important? Question 2. How can we estimate reliably the average performance? Question 3. How should we compare algorithms and account for variance? Question 1. What are the different sources of variation and which are the most important? The most common sources of variation reported in the literature is the random initialization of neural network weights. Let's first take a look at this source of variation. We will train a VGG11 on CIFAR10 and randomly vary weights initialization at each training. Each block falling represents the performance of a trained VGG with a random initialization. We train 200 models. The blocks stack above each other, showing the distribution of the performances, with the corresponding standard deviation shown as a bar plot on the right. Let's look at more sources of variations before making any observation on the results. Another source often neglected is the ordering of the data during the optimization. Again, we train 200 models, this time only varying the ordering of the data. Finally, since the data in CIFAR10 is IID, the splits for training and testing are arbitrary and can be randomly generated. We train 200 models on random splits, keeping all other sources of variation fixed. So far, all training were done with fixed hyperparameters, but the hyperparameter optimization itself is also a source of variation. Take random search for instance. Each time we execute a random search, we will obviously end up with slightly different hyperparameter values, and this will affect the performance. Running hyperparameter optimization is expensive, so we will only execute 20 runs with a budget of 200 trials. That means we will train 10,000 models in total, and each block is the performance of the best model in a run of 200 trials. Again, during the hyperparameter optimization, all sources of variation are held fixed except for the seed of random search. Finally, we randomize everything to observe the cumulative variance. Each block is the performance of the best model in a random search. Sources of variation are randomized from one run of random search to another, including the seed for random search. They are kept fixed within each random search, however. We don't want to optimize the seed. But this is just one task. Maybe these observations were not generalized to different tasks. Let's try different ones. Let's train ResNet18 for segmentation on Pascal Vlock and a feed-forward neural network for protein binding predictions on MHC, and a BERT for sentiment analysis on GLU SST2, and another BERT for textual entitlement recognition on GLU RTE. Let's get rid of the histograms to focus on the standard deviation. First observation. Weight initialization is not the most important source of variation. This is shocking, because it is the gold standard in the literature to report the variance of the performance as a function of weight initialization. Second observation. Data splits is consistently the most important source of variation. From larger test sets of 10,000 examples, CIFAR10, to smaller test sets of about 700 examples, GLU RTE. This is also shocking, because standardized datasets in machine learning provides fixed splits, leading us to ignore this important source of variation. Third observation. Standard deviation due to hyperparameter optimization is about as important as the one due to weight initialization. This is concerning, because executing multiple hyperparameter optimization runs to measure this variance is not affordable for most researchers. It is too computationally expensive. The variance illustrated in this graph is based on our previous measures, adjusted in function of the accuracy of the different methods. It is large enough to be concerning, large enough to invalidate state-of-the-art results. Undoubtedly, we are making progress overall, but not all apparent improvements may be relevant. Question 2. How can we estimate reliably the average performance? Ideally, we should randomize all sources of variations. This includes hyperparameter optimization. 
To estimate the mean performance of a learning algorithm, for each performance measure, we should vary all sources of variation with random seeds, then execute hyperparameter optimization and measure the performance based on best hyperparameters. We call this estimator of the mean performance the ideal estimator. For an average on k measures, it requires however training k times t models, where t is the budget for hyperparameter optimization. A cheaper alternative is to first randomize all sources of variation, execute hyperparameter optimization once, and reuse the best found hyperparameters. For each of the k measures, we vary all other sources of variations and then train and test always based on the same best hyperparameters. We call this estimator the fix H of estimator. For an average on k measures, it requires only k plus t trainings. The number of trainings required by a fixed H op is significantly lower than the one for ideal estimator. But the ideal estimator is more reliable. It is the ideal one after all. If we look at the variance of the ideal estimator, we see that it converges to zero as k tends to infinity. For the fixed H op estimator, it has the variance of a sum of correlated variables because of the correlation induced by the usage of a fixed set of hyperparameters. The correlation factor, rho, will bound the lower limit of the variance as k tends to infinity. But we never train an infinity of learning algorithms. How does it look like in a reasonable regime of k? Let's first make a simulation to visualize the behavior of both estimators. We have simulations according to the ideal estimator on the left and according to the fixed h of estimator on the right. Each whisker is an independent simulation. We sample k points and compute the average, the center of the whiskers, and the standard deviation, the length of the whiskers. At the top, we represent with the large whisker the distribution of the mean estimations. A good estimator should have all whiskers well aligned and a variance close to zero. As we increase k, all whiskers slowly align in the center, and the standard deviation of the estimations, as represented by the length of the whisker at the top, converge to zero. It is true for both the ideal estimator and fixed h up estimator, because so far we simulated a fixed h up with zero correlation, as you can see indicated on the right. Now, as we increase this correlation, the whiskers randomly drift apart, increasing the variance of the main estimation. Let's take a look now at correlation values in one of the tasks we investigated, BERT train on GLUE RTE. We plot the evolution of the standard deviation as a function of the sample size k. First, randomizing the weights only, the correlation is 1.05 times the level of variance. Second, randomizing the data splits only, the correlation drops to 0.3 times the variance. Finally, randomizing everything except hyperparameter optimization, the correlation drops to 0.08 times the variance. Without a doubt, ignoring hyperparameter optimization is damaging for the quality of the mean estimator. At the very least, we should randomize all sources of variations to attenuate this effect by decreasing the correlation. We will now look into comparison methods using mean performance estimation to draw conclusions when benchmarking machine learning algorithms. Question 3. How should we compare algorithms and account for variance? The common method to benchmark learning algorithms is the average comparison. Given a model A and a model B, we compute the averages of each and verify whether the difference between their averages is at least greater than some delta. Delta is a threshold arbitrarily set by researchers based on known past results. Another way of comparing algorithms is the probability of outperforming a statistical test based on man Whitner u test. To calculate this, we randomly train A and B and compare performances. Each block represents the performance of a training. The farther on the right, the better. We pick the best one, then train other pairs of A and B multiple times and compute the frequency at which A was better than B. This is the probability of A being greater than B on a given run. We then compute a confidence interval and make a statistical test. When drawing a conclusion on whether A is better than B, we want the result to be statistically significant. This means that A being similar to B should not be likely based on the results. In other words, the confidence interval should be on the right of 0.5. However, A could be marginally better than B, which is of little interest. Therefore, we also want the result to be statistically meaningful. 
A should be better than B by at least gamma. This gamma is defined by the experimenter based on practical considerations. For example, if A is better than B by gamma, then it is worth the cost of re-implementing our inference pipeline for customers. The confidence interval should cover or be on the right of gamma for the results to be statistically meaningful. The test can sometimes be either significant or meaningful. It must be both. We will now use our data from our investigation of the mean estimators to run simulations of statistical tests. This will tell us how reliable a common average comparison in a statistical test with probability of outperforming are with an ideal or a fixed age of estimator. Let's first look closer into this x-axis to better understand what is the simulation. We will simulate performances for learning algorithms A and B. For each algorithm, we sample 50 performances according to a normal distribution. Each row, composed of orange and blue strikes, is an independent simulation. When simulating the fixed age of estimator, we randomly bias the distributions based on row. We vary the average performances so that the simulation go from a setup where probability of A is greater than B is about 0.4, the one where probability of A is greater than B is about 1. From 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, it is the region where our null hypothesis is true. A is not better than B. From 0 0.5 to 0 0.75, it is a gray region. A is better than B, but not enough for the difference to be meaningful. From 0 0.75 to 1, it is the region where the alternate hypothesis is true. A is better than B by at least gamma. Assuming the data is normally distributed, the most reliable statistical test on a minimal budget would provide us this blue curve. Y-axis is the rate of detections, the frequency at which a test states that A is better than B. On the left region, the lower the better. On the right region, the higher the better. Let's start with a single point comparison. We decrease the simulation to k equal 1. For each simulation, we represent the outcome with a square red for negative, green for positive. If the difference computed is larger than delta, then the test is positive. As we reach 0.5, the rate of detection is at 9%, which is fairly high. Common practice is to seek for a 5% detection rate at this point. As we reach 0.75, the rate of detection is at 25%, which is very low. We would seek for a 95% detection rate at this point. Single point comparison is far from the optimal. Let's increase our simulation back to k equal 50 and look at the average comparison. Again, red squares are negative outcomes for the comparison in the simulation. Green are positive. When the average difference reaches delta, the comparison becomes positive. As we reach 0.5, the rate of detection is close to 0%, which is very low. As we reach 0.75, the rate of detection is at a dramatic 6%. This means that we would have a rate of 94% false negatives. False positives are often considered as more important. We do not want to claim false discoveries, but false negatives are just as important. With a rate of 94% false negatives, it means even if you would make an important discovery, just a few would be able to reproduce it. Think of it. If a result reproduces only 5% of the time, would you believe A is better than B anyhow? Or would you falsely believe that the original result was a false positive? Yet it is true, A is better than B. The ability of detecting a true effect is called the statistical power of a test. An average comparison has a very low statistical power unless delta is chosen well. A statistical test is specifically designed to choose this threshold properly, be it delta or gamma. Let's now look at the probability of outperforming. Again, red squares negative, green squares positive. The whiskers must be on the right of 0.5 threshold for the simulation result to be statistically significant and must cover or be on the right of the gamma threshold to be statistically meaningful. As we reach 0.5, the rate of detection is at 90%, which is very high. This is due to the fixed age of estimator, which is deceiving the statistical test. The curve for the ideal estimator is very close to the optimal. As we reach 0.75, the rate is at 79%, much higher than for the other comparison, but still short of a 95% that we would seek. Again, this is due to the fixed age of estimator. 
All in all, the statistical test provides a better balance of false positives and false negatives. The fixed HDOC estimator has a clear deteriorating effect on the reliability of the statistical test, but it remains anyhow a major improvement over a single point comparison or an average comparison. Recap About variance 1. Variance is large enough to be concerning. It should not be ignored when benchmarking learning algorithms. 2. Variance due to random data splits dominance. We should avoid using fixed splits. And 3. Variance due to hyperparameterization is important. We must account for it. About mean performance estimation. 1. The ideal estimator is expensive. It is rarely usable in practice. 2. Ignoring variance due to hyperparameterization hurts the quality of our mean performance estimation. And 3. Randomizing all other sources of variance helps reduce the loss of quality. About comparison methods. 1. A statistical test accounts for variance and is more reliable than ad hoc average comparisons for which it is difficult to choose a good delta. 2. The biased estimator degrades the reliability of the statistical test but is still a major improvement upon common single point comparison or average comparison methods. In short, based on these empirical investigations, our recommendations are 1. Use random data splits whenever possible. 2. Randomize as many sources of variation as possible. And 3. Use the statistical tests such as the probability of outperforming to benchmark your algorithms. This is a short summary. I invite you to watch our short 5 minutes video for a more detailed presentation of our recommendations. Thank you.